world that cries out for our attention and our time, or quiet all the noise and still the chaos that distracts us from you. Let all distractions fall away in this moment so that our full focus, our entire attention, our entire beings enter into a time of worship and praise. And Lord, let all that we say and do, think and sing, bring glory and honor to you. May this time of worship be found worthy in your sight. And as we leave this place today, may we be changed, having been in your divine presence. Amen and amen. Our opening hymn this morning is found on 154 in your hymnal. We'll sing all verses of all hail the power of Jesus' name.
fall under uh, a nation under our feet. God has gone up with a shout. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. For God is the ruler of all the earth. God reigns over the nations. God sits on the throne. The princes of the people gather as the people of the God of Abraham. I'd ask that you join with me as we pray a prayer of confession that can be found in your bulletin. Let us pray. Forgiving and gracious God, you have called us to be the church, to live out our resurrection faith. You have asked us to place our trust in you and to bring to the world the good news of your saving love. But we have failed to do this. We have given our faith a back seat to the troubles of our broken world and to the stresses in our own life. We look for the quick and easy answers. Forgive us for the smallness of our faith. You who raised Christ from the dead have promised to raise our spirits and bring us to new life. You have done this, and yet we remain unchanged in our response to you. Clear our spirits of the clutter of everyday living. Help us to always be open to your word and to your love. Challenge us to live and move in directions of peace and hope, mercy and love, grace and unity for all people. Hear now, O oh God, our own individual prayers of confession in this time of silence. Rejoice, dear friends, for when we confess our sins and our shortcomings with true and honest hearts, our Lord washes us whiter than snow. So rest in that assurance, for we are a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of faith is My Hope is Built. It's found on 368 in your hymnal, and we'll sing all four verses.
we hear in this time of worship. We rejoice in your steadfast presence and your unending love for each and every one of us. We thank you for the countless ways that you provide for and care for us, for the gift of fellowship with our friends and family, for the life-giving rays of the sun and the twinkling, sparkling stars of night, for food that gives us energy and water that quenches our thirst, for homes that give us shelter from the wind and the rain, for our very lives, Lord, we give you all thanks and praise. Lord, let us forever live our lives as grateful children, naming and claiming every good gift as coming from you. Let us always be filled with hope and gratitude and praise rather than worry and want and jealousy. Lord, let us never take any of our blessings for granted. But God, even in the midst of our blessedness and our living lives of gratitude, there are times of struggle, times of worry, and times of concern about the future. Many of those have been shared among us moments ago, but Lord, there are others, so many others. Places of fear and uncertainty, illness and grief, worry and concern. We lift these other worries and concerns to you now in this time of silence. Take each one, loving God, release their grip on our spirits. And in their place, a complete trust and hope and faith. Fill us with a deep, abiding assurance that you are indeed in control and that you alone know what is best. Lord, now we offer to you our prayers for our individual lives of discipleship and the life of this church and this faith family. God, you have called us to be faithful in our love for you and our love of neighbor. You have called us to be obedient in our worship, in our service. You have called us to be light in darkness and hope in times of despair and uncertainty. But too often, Lord, we fail to be the disciples and the church that you've commanded us to be. From this moment forward, Holy God, let us be intentional in deepening our relationship with you. Let us be intentional in our service to others. Let us recommit ourselves to the practices that enrich our lives of discipleship. Turn our vision upward to you and outward toward others. Widen our reach. Open our hands. Increase our trust and faith. Move our feet. Shake our up, Lord. God, let it be so. And now, God of wonder, God of might, we join our voices in praying. Praying the prayer that your blessed Son taught his disciples and us this day. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. for today comes from the book of Acts, the first chapter, the first 11 verses. In 
In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be 
see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of boiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised, so stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from all time. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple blessing God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Bet that if I ask anybody who's ever played the game of tag in their lifetime to raise their hand, every hand in here would go up. I did a little research on the game of tag and I found out, shockingly so, that the games like tag or tag like games have been played throughout history as far back as the 4th century BC. The origins of the name tag, I couldn't find anywhere. I couldn't find a source that said where it originated or anything like that. And, and in reading, though, I found out that the variations of the game of tag are endless. There's the plain old childhood game tag that we're also familiar with. And then we know that there's the freeze tag. But there's all these other games. There's chain tag. Cops and robbers, or river or mountain, or four corners. The list went on and on and on. The sky is the limit when you talk about the game of tag and all its variations. Now you're probably wondering what the world that childhood game of tag has to do with today's scripture lessons, but I promise it will make sense if you just kind of listen for a bit. As you know, today we continue to celebrate and journey through the season of Easter. Our pyramids are all still white and the cross is still wearing its beautiful white grace. We began celebrating the season of Easter on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. And on that day, we read the first 18 verses in the Gospel of John, chapter and now today, we hear from the end of Luke, chapter 24. Now the gospel writers aren't exactly clear on how much time has passed from the joy of Easter morning and Christ's ascension into heaven. In fact, Luke and Mark are actually the only ones that describe Jesus' final departure. And to complicate matters even more, the gospel writer Luke gives two different versions of the story. The one we read from the book of Acts, and then the one we just read from the gospel of Luke. But even though the ascension isn't included in all four gospels, all four gospel writers agree that Jesus gave his disciples an assignment before he left. He passes on the baton, so to speak. Basically, he tells them, I've done what I came to do, and now it's your turn. In essence, Jesus says, tag, you're it. So let's set the stage for today's two scripture readings. In our Acts text, it's 40 days since the resurrection. And in those 40 days, Jesus has continued to preach and to teach. He has walked 
world. They were terrified. They were afraid. They thought they were seeing a ghost. But Jesus reassures them, and he shows them his hands and his feet. And then Jesus does something that tickles me every time I read this passage. Basically, he says, so, you guys got anything to eat around here? <laughs> I love that. It's something so common and so normal seeming that it just had to have been comforting to the disciples. And so they share with him a piece of boiled fish. And he again repeats what he has been telling them all along. And that is, since the beginning of creation, God's plan has been clear. That Jesus is the culmination of the whole story up to now. Every bit of his life and ministry was in answer to Old Testament questions. And it was the fulfillment of Old Testament promises prophecies. And that is this. It all boils down to this fact. Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. I can just imagine the disciples agreeing and, and asking, you know, what we heard in that Acts text. Yes, Lord, we know all that. So what now? Now that you every miracle in the history of God's people, and now that he's even defeated death itself, what are we going to do now? Are you finally going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And so again, patiently, I'm sure, Jesus tells them what he has said to them countless times. And this time, their minds are open the scriptures. Much like Cleopas and his companions' minds and eyes and hearts were opened with their time with Christ on the road to Emmaus. After Jesus had filled his belly with that fish, he taught his disciples one last time. He took them out to Bethany, a village on the Mount of Olives, a place about two miles from Jerusalem. <coughs> Like I said earlier, I know this version does not agree with Acts' story, even though Luke wrote them both. Scholars can't agree on why Luke might have collapsed all the events between resurrection and the ascension into less than 24 hours. But for whatever reason, to me, it doesn't really matter that the timeline doesn't because to argue over how long it was between the resurrection and when Jesus ascended into heaven, I think is to get caught up in the details. And it's to lose focus on what's really important here. It's what my friend and mentor, Dr. Ken, would always call majoring in the minors. So with that discrepancy addressed and out of the way, let's get back to what's really important here. When Jesus arrives at the Mount of Olives and with his disciples, he knows that his time on earth is done. And so he raises his arms and he pours out a blessing in the text from Luke. And in Acts, he tells them that they will be his witnesses. And with that, Jesus is taken up in a cloud until they can no longer see him. 
I would have been thinking, how can Jesus expect so much out of me when I am so clueless? But no, that's not what the disciples did. Instead, we read in Luke's account, in verses 52 and 53, so they worshipped him and then returned to Jerusalem filled with great joy, and they spent all of their time in the temple praising God. Every time I read this passage about the ascension, I wonder about that transformation that happened to the disciples. The transformation between Easter morning and the ascension, whether it was one day or 40 days, they were transformed. I'm curious how these followers, who literally had just been hiding out in fear behind locked doors, turned fear and doubt into worship and praise. They have become completely different people. These followers of Jesus were scared out of their wits on Easter morning. And here we find them rejoicing. Returning to Jerusalem with what the scripture says, with great joy and continually blessing God in the temple. These guys who had already lost Jesus once on that horrific day, watching him suffer and die on the cross that wretched afternoon, they had such sorrow at his death, completely understandable. Fear and doubt and uncertainty. But now, when they lose him for a second time, they rejoice. What happened to them in the meantime? Well, I think the answer is in what Jesus says to them. They became witnesses. They knew that they had seen God. When Luke says they worshipped Jesus and as he ascended, he doesn't use that word lightly. In fact, this is the only time in Luke's entire gospel when the, we're told that the disciples worshipped Jesus. Now remember, these were good Jewish men. They knew the first commandment backwards and forwards. I am the Lord your God, and you shall have no other gods before me. They knew that God alone deserved their worship and praise, their adoration. So when Luke says they worshiped Jesus, he's really saying they finally knew him to be Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And I think that not only did the disciples realize that God was redeeming all of creation through his son, they also realized that they had a role to play in that divine work. You are going to be my witnesses, Jesus tells them. You are going to show the world what you now know to be true. Have. You're it. And here's the deal. We've been tagged to be it too. As people of faith, as Christ followers, we too are called to be witnesses. Witnesses to the power and majesty and glory of God. Tag, you're it. We're called to be witnesses to the restorative, redeeming love of we're called to embrace the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and live into the divine calling to be witnesses. Tag, you're it. But how are we supposed to do that, you might be wondering, as I shared earlier, what might have been going through the disciples' minds. What does that look like in our world today? Well, notice that Jesus didn't say, go do witnessing. He said, you will be my witness. He isn't asking you to add more things to your to-do list. 
He's asking you to make a new list, a to be list. Not that you need more items to check off, but that each item on your to be list makes you more like Jesus. So instead of going to more studies or reading more and more and more chapters and books and inspirational verses and all, Christ is calling you to be more hungry for the Word of God, to long for it, to be genuinely hungry and thirst for Scripture, to dig deeper, to learn and study with purpose, and to understand what the Scriptures are saying to you as an individual. Instead of signing up for more projects, in more programs and doing more work, Christ calls us to be more aware of the needs we see around us. To open our eyes to the hurts and brokenness of our world. Look outside ourselves. To see the world as God sees it and to let things that break the heart of God break our own heart. Instead of attending more meetings or reading more self-improvement books, Christ calls us to be more present with God. To take time to be still and know that He is God. To be more attentive to that still, small voice. To listen intently throughout all the activities and routines of our day. To withdraw from the chaos and noise that just clamors for our attention and be fully present and trust our God. Instead of saying things like, I got this or I'm fine out on my own, Christ calls us to be part of God's beloved community. And that's to offer support and encouragement to those around us who we know are hurting a sanctuary for those who are lost, to celebrate in others' joys and to mourn with them when they mourn, and then to lean into that same community when we find ourselves in a dark season. Basically, we're called to be the church. Instead of busying ourselves, being who the world tells us we should be, or popular, to be powerful or important, Christ instead invites us to be more of who God created us to be. To be the one who is fearfully and wonderfully made by the creator of everything, everything that has ever been, is now, and ever will be. Instead of doing things to gain favor in the sight of others or to try to earn our own salvation, we are to be more like Christ. To love as he loved, to give as he gave, to forgive as he forgave, to sacrifice as he sacrificed, to live as he lived. Y'all, that's our witness. But we can't witness on our own. In fact, we can't be Christ's witnesses under our own power at all. If we depend on our own strength and our own will and our own stamina, we would only be witnessing to ourselves, not Christ. Jesus told his followers they would be clothed with power from on high. Next week, celebrate that very first baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that came like a mighty rushing wind at Pentecost. And we will reclaim that powerful gift for ourselves, both as a church and as individual disciples. And that's really, really important, y'all, because tag, we are it.
together and there and say our blessings over our food. Receive now your benediction. Dear friends, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and then seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand, that same power is at work in each and every one of us who believe. So go now from this time of worship in confidence.